good to be with you all this morning and excited to be continuing in God's Word, working through the book of Philippians. If you haven't been with, if you weren't with us last week, we started just in chapter one. And if you want to start turning your Bibles there this morning, this topic this morning got me thinking this week about how interesting it is to hear from different people things that compel them, things that they're passionate about. I've joked before in a, in a service here that uh, one of the things I dread to do in life, and maybe you have the same thing, I really don't look forward to going to the dentist. So every six months when that time is up and you're like, oh man, so this last week happened to be this. Well, one of the things I've realized is I, I don't necessarily uh, hate the power drill in my mouth, although I don't like that. I don't, I don't mind them like ripping my mouth jaw much farther than it's intended to go. I, that's okay. The thing that probably bothers me the most is the guilt trip for inconsistent flossing. Anybody else in this camp? Like that, that, that's the part that's like the hardest for me. Like I, I, I have a hard time here. So I came a little more equipped this time because between my last visit, I had been pointed to a number of different articles. Here's a few of them listed here on the, on the screen. Does flossing help or not? The evidence is mixed at best. The evidence for flossing benefits is not good enough. Everyone recommends flossing, but there's hardly any proof it works. Feeling guilty about flossing? Maybe there's no need. And the list goes on and on. So, so, so I engage with a lady, just like, hey, you know, just, just making a uh, small, I was, thinking, I was reading some articles, and uh, I was explaining to her, like, I, I, I've, uh, I've read some of these things that have maybe uh, attested that maybe it's not as critical as you might think it is. Whoo! That was opening up a can of worms. I mean, I pressed a hot button like none other. Like she literally took it out on every single one of my teeth for the next 45 minutes from the power drill to the flossing. Well, I think it's really important. I'm like, okay, I'll never bring this up again. You see, you see, there's things that were wired, things that were given that, that man, is just the hot button, the thing that wakes us up in the morning, the thing that compels us. Maybe it's a silly thing like flossing, but for, if we're more serious about it, a lot of us, if you reflect through your kind of life and, and what it is that motivates you, maybe, just quite possibly, you might be compelled by the wrong things too. I don't know. Think about that for a second. What is it that gets you up in the morning? What's the thing that motivates you that's passionate? Is it, is it family? Is it a job? Is it a goal that you're trying to meet? Is it something you're saving for? Is it a cause? I don't, I don't know what it is for you, but I would propose that it's good on occasion to assess that, to ask some tough questions, to say, what is it that's, that's motivating me? What, what's driving me? And then the dangerous question that follows that is it the right thing? Is it the right thing? You see, if we're just kind of doing our own thing and going our own direction, then there's all kinds of flexibility. You can really go any direction you want with what you're passionate about or what you're pursuing or, or after. But if you make the claim that you're following Jesus Christ, that changes things. Then all of a sudden you have to start asking the question, what compelled him? What was he passionate about because you can't claim to follow someone and not be interested in what they were passionate about. And I would say this morning, we're going to see in the text that Paul, as he's following Jesus' example, he's compelled by one driving passion more than anything else. And we'll see it this morning just spl splashed all over the, the, this section of Scripture. But what it is, I'll give you a little preview. It's he's compelled by advancing the gospel message. I say advancing the gospel message, that sounds very churchy, but let me just give a quick summary. Basically, making sure that people understand the gospel, and the gospel is this, that we're separated from a perfect God because of our sin. We're separated from him, but God didn't leave us in that situation. He intervened, came, lived the perfect life as a man here on earth, died on a cruel Roman cross to pay the sacrifice, then rose again, and then gave man the option to either accept or reject that free gift. And that's the gospel message. It's a gospel of rescue to mankind. 
And so what Jesus was about, and you see that all through his entire life, was about rescuing mankind. And if we're following him, we should have that same driving passion in our life. Otherwise, you have to ask some tough questions. Am I really following him? Let me pray as we expose some of these passions in the life of Paul. God, thank you for this morning and for this text. I'll tell you what, it's definitely a wake-up call, just seeing the passion that drove Paul as to even asking questions in my own life. What is it that compels me? God, I pray that you'd speak to us this morning, that this text would even give examples that, that aren't for the person down the road, but are speaking directly to us, to me. We ask that your Holy Spirit work in this room as only you can, speaking directly to people's hearts. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're looking at verses 12 through 18 this morning and really breaking down, I'd say the different things, the different changes that you'll notice if you're compelled by the gospel. In other words, if you're being motivated by the gospel, there's some things that you'll start to notice happening that you'll see that's happened in Paul's life. Look at verse 12. It says, I want you to know, my, know brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. First observation there, when compelled by the gospel, you realize it's not all about you. Let's break that down a little bit. First thing that I want you to know, in other words, listen up, this is very important, is what Paul's saying, and he refers to brothers, so you know that he's talking to other followers of Jesus Christ. It's kind of something that maybe only would make sense if you're an insider, if that makes sense. If you're an insider, this idea of being driven by the gospel uh, makes sense outside that, that circle, probably not. What you notice is that Paul's figured out how to see adversity in terms of an eternal perspective. Look at what he says. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, when, when circumstances and trials, when difficulties in life come, which pretty much it's a guarantee they will, right? Anybody notice that in your life? You're either, I'd, I'd suggest that you're either currently in a trial, you're coming out of a trial, or you're about to go into a trial. You're in one of those three camps. Let's be real here. And, and, and so what, what, he's saying, what he's saying there in the text is he's recognized when he says, what's happened to me and what has happened to him, he's currently in prison. Year number four, remember? We talked about that. Year number four for a crime that he didn't commit, basically being put in prison for following Jesus Christ. What you realize is when we hit trials, you can either ask one of two questions. You can ask the common question that everybody asks around us is what is happening to me fair? Is what is happening to me fair? A lot of times that's the first question that we go to when something difficult's happened. You're like, man, it just doesn't seem fair that this has happened to me. They're like, what did I do to deserve this? How many of you, have, if you're honest, have even slipped into that thinking yourself? Well, is this fair? Is this fair? Or, and it's funny how perspective, perspective has everything to do with all this, or flip the point on that, asking the question is, what is happening to me furthering God's purposes and expanding his kingdom? And the thing is, is we have everything to do with that question. You see, Paul could have written this. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me is a bunch of junk and I didn't deserve it. You know, that's if he asked, answered the question, is it fair? But instead he says, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, our response to, to trial, because the world is watching, our response to, the, uh, to trial can either authenticate the gospel message or it can make people like, well, I don't know. By watching their life, doesn't seem like they really believe what they claim to believe, especially about eternity. I was thinking this week of examples of people that have handled this gracefully. Uh, some of you that are newer may, may not have uh, known Nancy Melanie. Here's a, a picture of her with her daughter. It was a real blessing to our church. And I'll tell you what, watching her, she ended up with pancreatic cancer. And watching her in the last months and days of her life, man, the way she walked with grace, this balance of, man, not getting caught up of the complaining and the, oh, I can't believe this is happening. She was all about pointing the glory to God, 
pointing to how he had worked in their family, the awesome things he'd done, doctors, nurses, whoever would listen to her in church on Sunday mornings. Like, man, you would never guess what she was in the middle of. She effectively pointed to Jesus Christ. I'm like, man, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be deter. I want. I don't want my circumstances to determine my response. Paul had resolved, I'm not going to lose my joy over my circumstances because I see the bigger picture at work. That's the first clue to know if you're committed and consumed by the gospel. Verse 13, we also start to notice when you're consumed by it, the, the ripple effect it has around us. It says, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's pointing out some different things, some positive things that have come as a result of him being in prison. You may have noticed that when you're consumed with something, you start to notice it more consistently around you. Here's a, a silly example. When I first started losing my hair and I finally shaved this sucker off, I was, I was really, I was, I was really uh, scared to do that. I remember coming out of the bathroom and showing Adrian, and she started crying. It was a pretty dramatic thing. And so, and so, so but here's the funny thing that, that, I, that I noticed is when I finally did it, my eyes were opened to how many baldies there are out there. I started noticing them in the grocery store. I started seeing them at the movies, in the, in the church. It's wonderful. Like, we're all over the place. We're going strong, even though we're follically challenged. And, uh, and, and, and here's the, the thing, is when you're sensitive, when, you, when you're passionate about something, when it's on your mind and heart, all of a sudden you start to notice it around you. are like, oh, that's there, that's, that's there, that's there. And it's the same thing has happened in, in Paul's life. All of a sudden, he's more, more sensitive to God's hand at work, the ripple effect both inside the church and outside the church. Take a look at the text. Outside the church, you see the ripple effect. It says, so that it has been known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Pretty cool to think about that. When I first was explaining Paul in prison, I was actually misunderstanding. He spent different times in prison, as you know. And at some points, he's in a, in a closed cell. During this period that he's writing this, he's actually chained to another Roman guard, an imperial guard, if you will. And so they'd go through, because he was such a high-profile prisoner with so much uh, influence, they're like, man, we got to take this serious. We can't let this guy get out again. Like, this is, this is a big deal. So he's literally attached... 24 hours to a, a day in house arrest, actually in Caesar's household, to another guard, and they took shifts as to who would spend time with Paul. Now think about that for a second. Do you, th- th- this is uh, interpretation by voting. Do you, do, you think, do you think if you're chained to Paul for any extended period of time, do you think you heard about Jesus Christ. Do, do, do you think anybody, do you think these guards got to hear anything that, that he had to say about Jesus? Or, or do you think it was just he saved it for his writing? Like, I'm pretty, pretty confident if you're there. And it's funny because isn't that the same with us where we can either get caught up thinking of our situation as a prison some of us, that's how we describe employment. Uh, some of us, you're like, you can either see your workplace. What if we started seeing our workplace like this? Either I'm stuck there doing this, or what if you twisted that and they're like, they're stuck with me. <laughs> and like, insert in sinister laugh. Uh, but, 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 but here, think about that. You're, you're, you're there with the potential to influence. I had a, a tough conversation this week with uh, actually a couple that their, their health is causing, that they're moving into a, a senior home, and they're really fearful about that. And I know that's a traumatic time in a lot of people's life. And just having a conversation, trying to encourage them, as especially talking to the gentleman, saying, man, this is something that you can, you can turn how you see this. Because you can choose to see it as like a, a woe is me, or you can see it as, man, this is an adventure where you can have an influence on people that might never otherwise hear about Jesus Christ. 
might otherwise never hear about Jesus Christ. And so that was kind of a, hopefully a turning point even in their thinking about their circumstances. You see, Paul, when he's compelled by the gospel, he starts to notice, man, there's a ripple effect. Here's a couple of fun facts that about Imperial Guard. Although I think that was, isn't that the red guys in Star Wars? But Imperial Guards. So this was the true Imperial, Imperial Guard. The Imperial Guard was somebody that was in Caesar's household. They were kind of a mix of uh, kind of a, a blend between West Point grad and a Secret Service agent. They were the top of the top. top. They were the, the, the actual bodyguards for the Caesar. And so this was a a big role in uh, the the Roman Empire. And in fact, if you think about that, when he uses terms, when he says to them, they after after I learned also after twelve years, uh, they're given a severance and transferred to more influential careers. So these were like the young difference makers. So if you're thinking through, how am I going to reach the Roman Empire? with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, let's just have him on shifts attached to you over a period of time. So he's literally advancing the gospel in ways that you'd never imagine because of this influence. And it wasn't just that they became aware of Jesus. I love at the end of Philippians, in Philippians 4.22 in his final greetings, this is what Paul says. He says, All the saints greet you, especially, so saints being followers of Jesus, especially those of Caesar's household. Isn't that cool? So he's, he's thinking, he's, he's having this ripple effect outside of the world, uh, in the outside world, in a, in a major way. And then also, in the inside of the church. What does it say in verse 14? And most of the brothers, he's talking about the, the Roman Christians there in the church, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Basically, he's saying, not only am I influencing because of my imprisonment all of these these difference makers in the the Roman Empire, I'm also influencing the church. Have you ever heard the expression before, certain things are are caught, not taught? This idea that that sometimes when you see, when you're around somebody that's contagious and and passionate, you're like, man, I I can do that too. I'm suddenly, it's, it's contagious. When we're passionate and bold about something, other people are like, man. I want that too. I want that for my life. I want my life to be driven by purpose and meaning and passion. And, and so that's exactly what was happening. When they're seeing them, our, uh, seeing Paul, you realize that our, our courage has the potential to inspire others. They're starting to see him and be like, wait a second. If he can do that from a prison, from being chained to a Roman guard, man, why wouldn't I do that? In the world around me, and as I'm, as I'm going to the grocery store, as I'm interacting with people at the gym, as I'm discussing things over the, the water cooler, like, why wouldn't I be bold like that? See, that's what was happening. And he was saying, not, not just a few of them, it says, and most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord. If you think about it, I lo- like that description, becoming confident in the Lord. Really, sharing the gospel message, if you think about it, is a confidence issue. Sharing the gospel message is a confidence issue. When we're confident about it, then you're like, hey, I can talk to anybody anytime. It doesn't really bother me. I'm, I've kind of moved past the, the fear piece. All of a sudden, the, the, the urgency supersedes fear. That's a good place to be. When we get so urgency supersedes fear. We we're talking in our life group on Friday night. We get together at someone's home this Friday, and we spent a lot of time talking just about what does this look like in the everyday, how do you interact with people, about uh, your faith, those interactions. And we got, kind of got on this little bit of a, a tangent. Anybody in life groups uh, get, get on tangents sometimes in your discussion? We started talking, and it'll make sense that, sense that it's a tangent. We started talking about the John Bonet case. You guys, uh, are you guys familiar with this whole thing? The Ram, John Bonet Ramsey, little girl, weird name. Uh, 20 years ago, murder case. And it was fascinating in our group hearing each one of them give every single detail. In fact, I mean, they, they knew everything. The girl still had pineapple in her stomach. You know, like she, the, this, this fact and this fact, and you're like, wow, you know that stuff like none other. Then bringing it full circle, there's, there's kind of in the conversation, but I don't know that I feel a equipped enough to know everything about Jesus and ready to share that with people. I'm kind of, and I'm like, 
wait a second. We know everything about the case about this little girl's murder from 20 years ago, but the thing that consumes us, the, the gospel message, we're like, I don't know if I'm ready to talk about that quite yet. I would push back a little bit on that and say, I think we're more ready than we think we are. I think we're more ready than we think we are. There's not some ding, 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 you've arrived, now you can start sharing. Like, no, no, it's something. Share what you know and let God fill in the gaps. Share what you know and let God fill in the gaps. And that's what he was doing. He was stirring the pot by his boldness in prison and it was contagious. That's what I'd love to see for us as a church as we start taking more and more risks with our faith because why? Because there's a lot at stake eternity for folks is on the line. So, when compelled by the gospel, you'll notice its ripple effect. And then this last one, and this is a fun one. You guys will like this one. When compelled by the gospel, other Christians won't steal your joy. When compelled by the gospel, <laughs> other Christians won't steal your joy. Take a look at this. This is a fascinating little section of scripture. It says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice." Let me explain a little bit. The first thing that's interesting about this, this is one of the the few texts that I can think of that exposes false motives among Christians. There's some Christians, it confirms what many of us have felt for many years, that there's some Christians that do stuff with the wrong motives. It's out there, all right? We just got to, it's out in the open now. You've heard it. Some people do things with the wrong motives. That's true. It's true. And what he's pointing out here is interesting. He says some do it. What does he say that they do it out of? Out of envy and rivalry, selfish ambition. You see, church world, which is kind of ironic, can kind of become that if we're not careful. With with kind of gift envy, you know, he's doing that. I kind of wish I was Alan Kegel running the seniors ministry. Like that looks kind of cool. Like I I I, I or you, you see what happens, and even here's a confession. Even with pastors, we get that. We see the mega church down the down the street, and you're kind of like, well, that would be cool if I was pastoring the mega church, you know, like that. Like you see the same thing. I'm guessing was happening. At, at, with Paul. Paul's in prison. All of a sudden, these guys are like, you know, it looks like there's a vacancy in the top spot. You know, it looks like there's an opening. And all of a sudden, rivalry and envy can take its ugly uh, roots and, and, and get in there and do a work on Christians and move them in the wrong direction. It's true. And it's a dangerous thing that all of us should be aware of. And what's the second piece? The selfish ambition. People that are using the gospel, not just to elevate themselves, but for financial gain. We see it with the personal jets that make the news. We see it with the mansions. You see that and you're just like, oh man, once again, it's gotten broken. It's, it, it's off, off kilter. But here he's saying, the good news is though, even though their intention was to inflict me in my prison, I don't know if that's them undergirding his ministry. Hey, we probably shouldn't follow a, a guy in prison. Uh, I don't know what, what it was. But he points out the opposite side of the spectrum, that there are some that are doing it out of goodwill and love. That's encouraging, right? There, there's some people that are compelled that are genuinely doing this because God's gotten a hold of their heart and changing them radically from the inside out. And that's compelling them. That's motivating, that's stirring the pot. And, and it, I like what he says about those, per, those people. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. Get a clue as to what's going on there. They recognize, those that are doing it by, out of love realize, whoa, this has given Paul a platform that he most likely wouldn't have otherwise. When you're compelled by love, all of a sudden you start to see it for the bigger picture. Wait a second. This is, this is an awesome thing for us, and it's fun to talk and interact with people even in our church to hear the different platforms he's given you, the different venues he's created for you. You're, there's no such thing as being somewhere that you're not supposed to be. God's 
put you exactly where you're at for, for this time and for this season for a reason. He has you on mission. That's what he's saying there. I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. If you're wondering why you're put where you're at, it's for the defense of the gospel. When I was first uh, starting out of my undergrad, my heart was to go into some kind of vocational ministry and kind of seeking the Lord on that. And God, where do you want me? And, and uh, that landed me working at a company called Manpower, which really had nothing to do with ministry. It's actually, uh, I was right, working in HR there. I was the person that was interviewing people and putting them on different jobs. And I remember for about two and a half years working there, serving in the church and being really involved after hours. But my heart was like, man, I just wish I could give the primary hours of my day towards ministry. Well, during that time, I was partnered up, and there was a girl that was working there at the same time. Her name was Gia, kind of a fun name, uh, and, and had a chance to just on multiple occasions just share with her about the gospel, share and share. But the whole time, I'm like, how much longer until I get to be in real ministry? Let me get back to talking to Gia about Jesus. And, uh, and I was like, man, how much was I missing it that I was literally like out on the front lines of ministry? For a lot of you, you're like, hey, I'm not, I'm not working in a local church, but guess what? You're out on the front lines of ministry, potential for influence to people that might never literally step in the, inside of a church. And for us to start to see it from that perspective changes everything drastically. Starting to see it, Gia ended up, just a little side note, I think I've mentioned it before, ended up uh, eventually coming to Christ, ended up for a season, I think she's back stateside now, was a, a missionary in China because she came into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. You're like, oh, that's why you have me there. That's why you're doing that. That's what, that's what you're working. It's bigger than me. That's good news to find that out. It's not all about me. That's wonderful news. So here, back to the big idea. When compelled by the gospel, other Christians won't steal your joy. So although it was discouraging for him to hear this, to see that like all these, all these, uh, these people are doing out of, out of the wrong motivation, look how he responds to it. He says, what then? In other words, what, what are my thoughts on this? Look at his thoughts. Only that in every way, whether in pretense, bad motives, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. That's a wonderful place to get when you've resolved that I'm not going to lose my joy over other Christians and the goofy stuff they do. You know, like that's, that's so good. And that's where Paul's just like, hey, because I'm compelled by the gospel, because I'm compelled... That's my one concern. And because I'm compelled by that, I'm not really concerned about their motives. I'm not really concerned about, I mean, I'd love to see them grow and improve in this, but I'm not going to let that rob me from what I'm called to do. I think too many people have quit on the church because of crazy Christians, right? Too many people have quit on the church and they've seen that as their ticket out and say, I'm just, I'm out of here. Forget it. They're all, they're, they're all messed up. They're all crazy. And you're like, well, maybe. But, but, but the other side to that is, is maybe God's still using broken, imperfect people to proclaim a message that can change people's eternity. How often you have somebody come to you and ask you about this, like, hey, what are your thoughts? They might ask you about a particular pastor. What are your thoughts on, on Benny Hinn? What are your thoughts on, on Joel, Joel Olstein? What, what are your thoughts on the Presbyterian church and what's going on there? What are, your, what are your thoughts on this denomination, on this particular church? What are your thoughts? Here's a wonderful answer. Here's a wonderful answer. You guys got this? Ready? This is a wonderful answer. Are they proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are they proclaiming that we were separated from God because of our sins? God didn't leave us in that place. He intervened and came down, lived the perfect life, died on a cross for our sins, a cruel Roman cross, rose again on the third day, gave us the choice to accept or reject that free gift. If they're proclaiming that, guess what you think about that other church and that pastor and that ministry? Woohoo! I love them. That's great. I don't have to agree with some of the peripheral silly stuff. I can, I can disagree on some of that stuff, but as long as we're united under the gospel, the same thing is true here of what Paul's saying. Hey, they might do it out of pretense, out of crazy motives. They might be way whacked and off base, but that's okay because why? Because the advancement of the gospel. Why is the advancement so important? Because people's eternities 
are hanging in the lo- on the line. De- depending on what they do of the offer of Jesus Christ, what are they going to do with that? And so it's pretty cool to think about when somebody's consumed by the gospel, all of a sudden their circumstances don't steal their joy. All of a sudden, they start to see the bigger picture and the ripple effect of what's happening around them. Man, they're, they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And all of a sudden, even Christians can't steal their joy. I'd say that's not a bad existence when you're compelled and led by the gospel. That's my prayer for me. That's my prayer for this church. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much for this word from Paul. And I pray that even that idea of something being caught, not taught, jumps off the pages of this text. Somebody that was so driven and committed with loving and reaching people that are far from you, that even as circumstances being stuck in prison, even as circumstances with Christians opposing him, even as his circumstances of, of being chained to imperial guards didn't rob his joy, didn't take him off mission. I pray the same for us, that we wouldn't be so easily jilted, that it wouldn't take just a a small thing to take us off course of what God's called us to. I pray even this week that we'd start to live this out with more intentionality. Even just just taking little bold stands, at least getting the, the flag up that people know that we're following Christ. Pray that you'd work in all of us in this because there's a lot at stake. God, I thank you for the invitation that this is to a life of purpose. All of a sudden, it turns things that are mundane into significant. Pray that we'd see it like that. Our perspective would shift. Life would be interrupted. Pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. What a perfect ending to that message. See the source of our confidence. No longer a slave to fear. Why? I'm a child of God, man. You're sons and daughters of Almighty God. Why wouldn't we have a confidence and a boldness in that truth in and of itself? Amen? Let's live in that this week. God bless you. 